right, everyone. This next speaker, I know a lot about him. I know that he used to preach. But once I've learned that he was a ninja, nothing else is important. Uh, so everyone, please, please welcome to the stage, ninja preacher, Jerry DeWitt. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, believe it or not, I've actually got a few notes this morning. Do I have, what do I have, two hours? Say again? 50 minutes? I can't take up an offering in 50 minutes. All right, I'll pay attention. So thank you all for being here this morning. I will admit to you that I am far more nervous than I remember being in some time. If you saw your program, um, you saw some bizarre title that I gave weeks ago whenever I found out I would have the honor to be here. Thank you very, very much for allowing me to be here. Thank you. I do appreciate it. I realize that uh, this is a special slot to have, and it means the world to me to be honored enough by you to be able to be here. Also, thank you to my son, Paul Aaron, who is traveling with me as usual. I wouldn't be able to make it without him. We are together, Team DeWitt. How many people um, know my story already? Show of hands. Excellent. So we can get right past that part. <laughs> that really is important because I've changed my program and I have something totally, totally different to talk about this morning. How many of you already know what it is that we still do, that we do, once this story made national attention and we were outed and we began to live this very adventurous life with all of you? How many know what we do? What are excellent? A few of you do. If you don't know, please, before the day is over, maybe even before this presentation is over, go to jerrydewitt.net. It will take you to a Patreon page and you'll see that we're involved in everything from making gaming videos to making videos and audio clips related to messages all the way to the podcast, Hope After Faith. Anybody listening to the podcast, Hope After Faith? Excellent. Thank you very much. Usually Thursday nights, 8 o'clock Eastern time. So that's what we do. So now I want to warn you that I'm going to more than likely preach a little bit today. <clears throat> Thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> Sounds like I've got some permission. Um, if you think in any way that it's going to bother you for me to preach, I'm, not, I, I'm being very serious with you when I say I'm not going to be offended if you get up and you leave. I mean, even if you're sitting on the front row and my actions begin to trigger something for you, I, I get it. And nobody's going to judge you, and I'm not going to be offended if you have to get up and leave, because I know it can be different. But there is a very serious reason that we do what we do, and there's a very serious reason that I act like I act. And here is a good case. On my Facebook page a couple of days, a young lady posted this. She said, hey man, just wanted to let you know that last week I took my first exam in my science course. This was the first exam in 25 years, and I was pretty nervous. I did terrible in high school because I spent more time praying and letting God take the wheel. This time around, I took a different approach. Instead of prayer, I did work. I studied hard, and I got an A. At 42 years old, the first A of my life. This is the first step to my goal of getting a biochemistry degree and working on the origins of life. As you know, I've given up slowly and painfully. The reason I know is because we've been visiting and talking with her over the last few years. She says, as you know, I've given up slowly and painfully my faith in Jesus and now focus on science, of which I was taught growing up was the devil. I've embraced it and took and look forward to actually using my time on this planet wisely, not praying or paying alms to the great steaming pile in the sky. Her words, not mine. <laughs> Thank you for all you do. Keep up the good work. Let's give her a hand of applause. <laughs> the only reason that we've been able to be beneficial to someone's life like that is because of the way that you have been beneficial in our lives. 
The way that you've been beneficial is you've allowed me to tour this beautiful country. I've seen atheist groups, free thinker groups, secular groups of different kinds from one side of the continent to the other, and even in some other countries. While I was touring, heading, driving my little PT Cruiser, can I get a Darwin for the PT Cruiser? God rest its soul. While I was touring, heading towards California, I was out in the middle of the desert, scrambling for radio stations, trying to find something to listen to, and as luck would have it, I ended up landing on Glenn Beck's program. You don't know my politics. And so, having absolutely no other choice, I let it rest there for a little while, and it was a few years ago, and the president at that time, and sound guy, good luck keeping up with me, um... The president was beginning to push forward with the Affordable Health Care Act, and the Catholics were absolutely losing their minds. Do you remember this? Because they were inevitably going to be paying to help people get abortions in a very indirect way. People who worked for their non-church but yet still religious institutions. And Glenn Beck was losing his mind with them. And so as I'm cruising through the desert with the top down, getting a good suntan, Glenn begins to say these words. He says, every God-fearing American needs to fight this. Every God-fearing American needs to stand against the president. Every God-fearing, God, singular, every God-fearing. And then he begins to list who the God-fearing Americans are. He says, every Protestant and every Catholic. Well, having spent some time... In the religious world, I immediately, whoa, 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 whoa. theologically, you could make a case that they don't even worship the same gods. If you want to be honest, Catholics got a few more deities or demigods that they appreciate than most Protestants do, right? But then he goes on a little further and he says, and every Muslim, I'm like, whoa, huh? surely the evangelicals are not going to feel like that the Muslims and they worship the same God. They can't all be God-fearing people of some one singular God. And he goes further and he says, and even the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses, all these God-fearing people need to join together to fight this. And it began to deeply trouble me. And I thought, who is this one God? Who is this one God that both the Muslims and the Catholics could both be worshiping and standing united underneath and for? Who could this one God be? And over a process of time, it began to occur to me that actually, in America, there is this one God. This one God that I call Amerigod. Mm, Stay with me a minute. We're going to preach here in a minute. Come on now. So this one Amerigod has to have a singular history, and they do have a singular history. They have this very distorted view of the Founding Fathers and what the Founding Fathers believed and what the Founding Fathers tried to encourage the United States to be. They share this idea that all of the Founding Fathers are some type of super believers, some type of super Christians, and I'm going to focus a lot on Christianity. But more than that, if there is this Amerigod, and there is this one united congregation under the banner of Amerigod in the United States, they have to have a singular form of worship, and they do have a singular form of worship, and it is called political activism. We are at the point. Mm-hmm. We are at the point. That evangelicals in the United States feel like they are doing a better service to their God by going and voting than showing up in the pew on Sunday morning. I can get a Darwin out of that. That's fine. We live in a time that the evangelicals in particular, and I'm going to be busting their asses all morning, so stay with me for a minute. We live in a time that their form of worship is political activism. And it is based on this joint and distorted history of what the Founding Fathers wanted and what America was supposed to look like. As a matter of fact, if I'm correct that there is this one God, Amerigod, 
And the evangelicals are worshiping him together regardless. And when I say evangelicals, I'm not talking about just Protestants. I'm talking about these people who feel like they have to take over the United States and turn it into the kingdom of God today, politically. Dominionist of all different religious flavors. If that exists, then they may actually even have a singular prophet. Because you have to have a modern day prophet. Jehovah's Witnesses have a modern-day prophet. The Mormons have a somewhat modern-day prophet. Once was modern-day. Time slipped by. You have to have a modern-day prophet. And they have a modern-day prophet by the name of President Ronald Reagan. Think about it. How many times is Ronald Reagan's name thrown out there, right? The same way that you would say Joseph Smith or Brigham Young. How many times is Ronald Reagan's name? This is the last modern-day prophet of Amerigod. Obviously, we can see that there are some very, very serious problems with Amerigod. They even have a joint mission. Stay with me for a second. They have this joint mission of securing the Supreme Court. And they'll tell you that one of the main reasons they want to do that is to stop abortion. I can see where they would think that's an important mission. But my question is, how long has this God been around? Is this even the same God that people worshipped 50 years ago? Is this the same God that people, that Christians in particular worshipped 100 years ago? I'm talking to you evangelicals. Forgive me Dear secular congregation, but I'm probably going to look over your heads and look straight into that camera. And through the power of social media, I'm going to call them to repentance this day. Dear evangelical, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus that you embarrass. So I ask you, where did this God come from? How long has this God been around? In his book, The Magic of Reality, Richard Dawkins talks about speciation and how complicated that concept is to get our minds around. But he lays out a really clear idea of how you can distinguish one part of the species of the human race from another part. And he says, just get in a time travel machine. Why he didn't say TARDIS, I don't know. He missed an opportunity. I mean, when he could probably see one from his window. You know. Get in a TARDIS, travel back in time a little bit, take a modern human with you, try to breed them. I don't know if alcohol is going to be involved, but probably. <laughs> try to breed them with whoever you land up in their time with, right? And if they can breed successfully, that's the same species, kind of regardless of how they look. Go a little bit further back, and regardless of how they look, if they try to breed and they can't breed successfully, then scientists say that's a different species, right? Speciation. So, dear evangelicals, I wonder if I put you in a time machine and I took you back, I'm calling you out, Joel Osteen, if I took you back and I had you having intellectual intercourse with John Calvin, would you be able to breed doctrine successfully? Hell no, you couldn't. That ain't the same God. That's a different species of God. That's the power of religion is that it is able to evolve over time. And it is evolving into something that is completely different than what I even knew as a child. And I know that I look old, but I ain't that old. I ain't even tall enough to be over 14. So I have to ask you, what's going on? This America God. Where does this come from? What's happening? Well, I'm going to write a book about it. And I'm going to talk about it, but there's already a lot of great books out there that describe this, that talk about this. But I want you to know that this gets even more complicated than the speciation and the evolution of religion. Because within the evangelical world, within all religions, you have individual gods. The gods that only live within the mind of the individual. The interpretation that they have of their deity and the deity's characteristics. And I want you to know that the Amerigod that is being worshipped today looks nothing whatsoever like the Jesus that I was brought up to know and love. 
Not a bit. Not a bit like that Jesus whatsoever. That individual thought, that individual idea. Now, I realize every one of you right now are racing through the scriptures in your mind, and you're saying, yeah, but really the Bible's been around for a very long time, and there's all these problems, and there's all this evil. I get that. I understand that. That's why I'm emphasizing this individual concept that is spread between the hearts and minds of really good people. And in the hearts and minds of really good people of my childhood and even my young adulthood, there was a Jesus that really looked nothing like the Amerigod of today. He wasn't an AK-4, what is it, Paul? AK what? 47 toting Jesus. He was something totally different. Now, I don't believe there's a Jesus. I'm not even sure that there was a Jesus who ever even exists. But... There was a Jesus in my mind. There was a concept. There was a higher calling. There was was a better you that you could be. There was a more loving you. There was a more giving you. There was a more compassionate you. There was a higher self that you were being called to within this concept of Jesus that my grandmother shared with me as I would watch her take in every single stranger that would get nearby, as I would watch her let every single face of any color, any tribe set in her kitchen, and she would labor over a hot stove in order to make them a meal and fill their bellies and warm their hearts. I'm telling you, I was introduced to a total different kind of Jesus than what people are voting for today. I understand that there are things to be concerned about. I'm sorry, audience. You're just going to have to bear with me. Evangelicals, I understand there's things to be concerned about. I understand that you went to the voting booth because you were afraid of immigration. You were afraid of insecurities on our southern borders. I get that. I understand that. But I really thought you were far more brave than that. I really did. Whenever this election season first started, I told some of my closest relatives, such and such will never have a chance because the church going folks won't be able to tolerate that. But then Amerigod, the spirit of Amerigod began to sweep across the United States and begin to influence people and make justifications for people and tell people it was okay to not pay attention to this part as long as you were focusing on that part. We can swallow anything as long as we get the right Supreme Court members was their cry. The right Supreme Court members will put an end to abortion. The right type of people in place will secure our borders. I don't understand... This fearful concern of our borders and immigration. I happen to remember a story of a little family that was in need and a pregnant woman looking for a comfortable place to have a baby. But yet there was no room in the inn. The point of that story didn't praise all the innkeepers that said no. The point of that story praised the one innkeeper that said, this may be inconvenient, this may be a little awkward, this may be a little fearful, but I'm going to find a way to help another human being in need. That's the Jesus that you introduced me to. Why are you not voting for him? There's no room in the inn. But there was room. Room was found. Room was found for people who were different. Room was found for people who were traveling from one type of life to another. Room was found for people in need. You want to beat the secular world? Then get off of your ass and show your heart to the rest of the world. It's hard to preach a loving message and be as angry as I am. But I'm disappointed because for five years I've defended them before you. For five years I've tried to build a bridge. For five years I've tried to be compromising. For five years I've tried to stand in the gap for them. And they do this to me? Yeah, it's all about me. You didn't know that? (laughs) 
I understand immigration and such things are frightening and fearful. I get that. The right type of imagery was used. When every time the subject would come up, they would say, there's people being beheaded. There's people being beheaded. Well, there's this little book at the end of this bigger book that has about 66 books within it. And in the end, or midways through that last book in that bigger book, it talks about people who stand their ground even under the fear of being beheaded. I want to know where those Christians are at today. You think you're doing something by getting over your laziness and getting up on Sunday morning? Hell, we don't even believe in God and we're up on Sunday morning. You told me that the power of the Holy Spirit would enable you to walk out into the street with your wife, your husband, your children, and willingly allow yourself to be beheaded, willingly allow yourself to lose your life for your faith and for your God. Is America God so weak that he needs a wall? I understand that racism is frightening. I understand that this can be difficult. I understand that it's complicated. I realize that. I realize racism is complicated. I don't realize it nearly the way that some of you realize it. But even I can realize it. But I I remember this story. That was actually about racism. And the name of the story is, ta-da, the Good Samaritan. And it's completely about racism. That's your story. That's the story you told me. That's the story you wooed me with when you were trying to get me to fall in love with your Jesus. Are you telling me now that that story is not sufficient, that that story doesn't work anymore, that that's not the principles that we're supposed to be striving for, that that's not the principles? Am I no longer to be a good Samaritan? Is it more important to be a good citizen because without a wall you ain't got a country? No. God or no God, I think that a life striving to be a good Samaritan is still a life worth living. God or no God, I'm not going to be the one that goes to the other side of the street and looks at somebody who's different from me and says, your needs don't deserve to be met. Because I'm here to tell you, God or no God, love trumps hate. My thought was, was that we were to bind up the brokenhearted. You take some young lady that's struggling in her life, you don't deny her her rights over her own body because you're on a mission to stop abortion. You're on a mission. And the way that you're going to accomplish this mission is through legislation? Are you kidding me? Don't you worship the same God that told Elijah to build an altar and to drown that altar in all the water that they could find and still yet his prayers would be answered and a fire would be lit? You don't need Republicans. You need revival. You don't need legislators. You need love. You're worried about abortions. You're worried about trying to change the politics of this land. Don't worry about changing the politics. Pray to your God if he is real, if he's who you say he is. He doesn't need to change the politics. He can change the people. I thought you were here to bind up the brokenhearted. 
Well, I've got news for you. If you ain't going to do it, we will. If you're not going to do it, if you can't be trusted with this country and its needs, then we'll do it. I got news for you. We was already planning on doing it anyway. (laughs) Because we do take it seriously. We take people's lives seriously. We don't have some mythology or some pie-in-the-sky idea that allows us to justify cruel actions. We have to vote for today. We have to vote for people's lives today because it matters, and it matters today. We're not able to take the coward's way out. We're not able to take the lazy way out. We're not able to take the greedy way out. Are you kidding me? You are doing this and you're voting this way for your pocketbook? The Jesus that you told me about, he said, take no person or script. What is your problem? Where are you at? Who are you? I rebuke you in the name of your Jesus and I call you to repentance this day. Because I'm going to tell you, we are absolutely able to out Jesus their Christ. Somebody say Darwin or I'm going to preach another hour. I don't care if they turn my mic off. We are completely able to out Jesus their Christ. Because love does trump hate. Hate that is generated by fear. Hate that is generated by envy. Love can trump that. We may have not had our ground game together the way that we needed to. That is an anomaly. And we got four years to get our act straight. But as we're doing it, Let us be motivated by love. Let us be motivated by love. Let us be motivated by love. I know I haven't looked very loving. I'll do better out in the hall. (laughs) But dear believer, I know you. I know your name. I know your children's names. I know your struggles. I know when you've been unemployed looking for a job. I know whenever you've gotten that job and been so elated. I know when you've been afraid that the test results were going to be positive and we celebrated when they were negative. I know whenever you and your spouse were having rocky times and you thought your whole family was just going to disintegrate. I know how brave you were when you lost that baby and you thought your heart would never heal again I know I know that life is hard I know that the struggles are real and I know that you have no reason to give me any more credit and I know that I've burned a bridge with you but if you for just a moment can remember That you know me too. And you know my son's name. And you know how I've loved you. And how we've loved each other. If you can allow yourself to remember that. Then you know. Then you know I'm right. And you know. You know that love trumps hate. You can do this. Thank you.